All right, let's go ahead and get started with turning on Tanzu inside of VMware. Uh, this is going to be how we build out our platform as a service and it's integrated directly into VMware. One of the requirements is having NSXT. So if we have our workload management here, this is actually Tanzu. When we go to enable, it's going to give us a list of clusters that are allowed to be enabled on. going to ask us what size we want. So we can go ahead and have a uh, small control plane for what we're doing here. Uh, realistically, if you were in a, a standard environment that, uh, uh, you know, regular, small to medium size uh, business, medium would probably be where you want to go just so you don't have to worry about upgrading to large or creating a new cluster on a new, uh, or pardon me, creating a new workload management area on a new cluster. So uh, small is fine for our little proof of concept. Now we get into the fun part. So we're going to have to select our network, our starting IP address, subnet mask, gateway, our DNS server, NTP. There we go. So this is all just for your management piece. So this is this is where we're going to have all of our standard management happening. We're going to have VMs. This is where you control them. This is where you create starting IP addresses for VMs that you'll actually be able to see. Uh, but VMware has locked you out of them. So they're just going to kind of run. You're going to do your control of your workload management cluster uh, pretty much through the control window here, uh, you know, that, that workload management window, you're not really going to be doing it in the host and clusters environment. We'll go ahead and select our distributed switch. So this is our NSXT. So we're going to be using the edge cluster in NSXT. Ah, that part's optional. We're not going to worry about the uh, API server endpoint there. That's going to be a little bit more of an advanced thing. So this part doesn't matter, the pod cider and service cider. So this is internal to NSXT. So you're not going to see this. Um, if we were to do this inside of a bare metal Kubernetes that you build at home or you know in a lab, this is your Calico or flannel um, software-defined networks. So uh, you're not going to see these. What you are going to see is your points of ingress. So that'll be I'm setting them fairly large. Once again, points of ingress and egress. Like you know, you're, you're going to have you know, you got a namespace. You need to have an IP address for that namespace. Uh, I doubt that we're going to use you know, that. We're going to have 254. Uh, that we're going to need. So uh, realistically, you could probably drop that to a 28 or a 27. Uh, definitely something you want to plan on the size of your network. Uh, right. So these numbers have to be routable. So you have to be able to ping into these numbers. And it's probably in your best interest that these numbers be able to get out to the internet also. Well, not out to the internet, out to a network. So if you have your registry, uh, these guys are going to need to be able to capture it uh, from from DNS. So uh, just make sure that you can that they're visible, that you can actually use those IP addresses on your network. Uh, once again, this is going to be inside of the NSXT environment, so you're not going to want to have overlap with existing VLANs. You're going to want to have these as brand new VLANs um, inside of NSXT, shared through BGP or static routes, and then plumbed to DNS and you know with the capability to get to your registry. All right, so you have to use shared storage because these guys are going to move around. Uh, the shared storage uh, of choice for VMware is going to be vSAN. So I just go ahead and put all of these on vSAN.
We've completed all the steps, hit finish, it will submit. The screen will change in just a second, so being configured, we're able to look in here, see what's going on. Go to our hosts and clusters. It's just turned on namespaces and it's creating these supervisor control planes. So once these are done, you'll have an up and running system. When you go back in here to the workload management, this will be completed. It'll uh, allow you to check for updates. As far as VMware's communication, uh, um, you know, through through their uh, system engineers or sales engineers, uh, they have told me that when you patch vCenter, that is going to hold your Kubernetes update. So Tanzu is going to be updated through your vCenter. Uh, that should hold it uh, automatically. But if you're connected to the internet, you should be able to get your updates through here as soon as they're available. Um, I have seen, I believe, four updates uh, since April. And those updates are, you know, they're, they're fitting in line with uh, the Kubernetes lifecycle. So I believe it started off with Kubernetes version 16. Uh, then a patch to get it to uh, uh, a higher version of 16 uh, and I believe for Kubernetes it's 0 0.16 uh, and then you know up to 17 uh, and then up to 18 and I believe 19 was recently released so we will have we'll, we'll be able to see the updates come through uh, apply them there you want to make sure that everything is as healthy as possible before you apply the updates uh, another option is if you have um, dual clusters, then you can go ahead and update one cluster. That way, you can go ahead and uh, um, you can drain that cluster, put it on you know pr from a primary to a failover, drain your primary, activate it on the failover, run your update on your primary, make sure it all went through, drain those those uh, pods off of your failover, put them back on primary and validate that it actually worked, everything's good to go. And if you were waiting for some special feature, then make sure that that works. So one of the special features that is uh, fairly common uh, for, for people to, to want to use is the treating sidecars, uh, sidecars as a first class uh, container uh, or first class service, I believe. So for the longest time if you had a sidecar where you know you have a pod running and it has a sidecar that offers security or authentication uh, when you would have your orchestration run it would start up all of the first class you know pods all of your first class pieces and then it would go ahead and, and wait or not turn on your sidecars so I mean that that can just completely crash your environment if you're waiting for a service mesh to start or <clears throat> maybe uh, you know vault you know nice security piece to start and it doesn't until you ma until you have manual intervention in it uh, your system's gonna crash so uh, there are all kinds of workarounds different ways to script it but uh, actually having that as a piece in I want to say it's, it's in kubernetes 19 uh, that that's a big deal so um, <clears throat> of course Another big deal about this, and we can go ahead and check right now to see whether or not this is happening. But, uh, okay, yeah, so we're not there yet. But uh, uh, instead of uh, your, your standard service mesh, where you end up with uh, a lot of the same capabilities as micro segmentation and firewalling and load balancing and all that stuff, what's going to happen here? as soon as as this uh, configuration occurs so we're waiting for for the systems to be provisioned still so once these systems are provisioned we're gonna watch the segments jump up and that's for the management uh, of the workload domain so inside of uh, NSX you will have the ability to use all these advanced security tools that includes we'll, we'll also be able to have load balancers we'll be able to have snat we'll be able to have all these fun things that uh, uh, otherwise would be fairly difficult to configure inside of the standard uh, PaaS system if you're building a piecemeal
and we'll take a look and see where we're at here uh, they still are not powered on alright so we are still deploying the template there we go it'll give a reconfiguration initialize the power on so it's only going to power on the master initially so once this power is on that form that we filled out uh, as we're building this out that was actually collecting information uh, so that it could run a startup script to build this piece out now these are your this is your supervisor control plane so it it is going to be you know your multi-master um, and then your workers are actually running instead of kubelet it's running spherelet on your uh, on your hosts so this being the multi-master control plane with spherelet running on on your hosts um, you've you've got a full you know broad capability here inside of your cluster for the ability to run a lot of stuff so um, but this is management um, I believe at this point even we should be able to take a look at yeah so see VMware locks this down so if we proceed with this we are not allowed to change anything in here so this is all completely set there's nothing to change there's no there's no options that we can modify so these VMs are completely you know out of your control from this screen uh, if we were to go over to VMs and templates you wouldn't be able to control it from that screen the only way that you can effectively you you know change anything in here is going to be from inside of the workload management window let's go ahead and double check our NSX see whether or not uh, we've got anything going on in there uh, not yet So we are at that uh, IP address that was listed. We got our IPv6 address here. And once this is done with its configuration, there we go. So once once that configuration and completes, you'll see these other two boot, and you'll also see uh, the. Uh, uh, the virtual IP address for the cluster appear on here. Um, you'll begin to see some of the uh, pod CIDR addresses appearing on here. Um, the ability to reach in and out of the uh, software defined networking. So oh, also uh, your normal summary uh, window there will be nothing there ever I believe we're able to take a look and see uh, let's see our performance well, at least our vSAN performance here eh, nothing there there we go so we will be able to see memory utilization network use yeah so The DNS name, obviously, this is looking for the ability to update DNS. Uh, it's it, it may be its own internal DNS, something like core DNS, uh, for the ability for the management nodes to talk to each other. Uh, this is obviously not something that uh, they expect you to put inside of your own DNS server. Uh, they they should be writing their names, you know, to each other as they're part of the cluster. Yeah, let's see where we're at. Uh, this is also another fun one. So this does regularly time out. Uh, it'll time out, and then 
you can refresh it and it'll you know say hey I'm configuring this thing again um, a, pretty much a constant uh, during during the build out of this there we go we have our reconfiguration and we're starting to get our power ons you can see here we've got our VIP address we've got our actual node address I am curious if it's that time yes it is okay so now it has created all of the segment dom for the domain so we're domain C1006 on the system uh, that is the pod domain <clears throat> it gave us the uh, correct transport zone we do not have anything to do with these segment names it creates its own tier 1 gateway the tier 1 gateway is then connected over to the tier 0 gateway so this is all an internal piece inside of of the uh, pass system tier 1 gateway there it is all 14 link segments says it's up and running says we're good to go we go to our security look at our distributed firewall look at these rules so it is instead of the standard I'll show you here on this SSH rule instead of being applied broadly to the entire distributed firewall it is just it is just on this project so it's just this this piece that it's controlling and then we have you know very very close tight control of the individual IPs ports all that good stuff um, <clears throat> and all these are applied all of them are you know enabled we've got your standard deny all as the last rule and we go into our inventory it is going to list all of our containers and I mean even up here we have that's the service it's not a pod so that that's the namespace is default we get a service with networking attached but no pods <clears throat> so some of these things it's just okay these exist <laughs> they they have to be there um, but there is no actual pod backing some of these no services backing it's just a network backing um, so yeah this is a a full integration this is what comes with the system as you turn it on here's our cluster pod services networking so showing everything that that has to do with uh, your Tanzu system integrated with NSXT uh, once everything is up and running which uh, it, this is going to take a while for this to get fully up and running uh, then we'd be able to turn on our registry service once the registry service is turned on we can go ahead and start adding namespaces uh, we could actually add namespaces once this is up and running uh, I'd prefer having a registry because that way you have a nice little login where you can see any of the uh, containers that you're creating uh, anything that you're building and you can assign single sign-on uh, based on the VMware single sign-on so ni nice little piece there uh, <clears throat> as far as how this works uh, this is not kubernetes on bare metal this isn't you know running you know downloading and compiling kubernetes on a system this is called kind this is kubernetes in docker so they have dockerized Kubernetes, which not a big deal. I mean, it's an orchestration engine. Uh, the big important part is, is, and the heavy lifting is all the spherelet, which would normally be called kubelet, running on these systems here. So if all we're using this for is the Kubernetes orchestration engine, there's no reason not to run it in Docker. Um, and of course, depending on your cluster size, uh, you can go ahead and break down smaller clusters and set up as many as you need to make sure that you don't 
go uh, don't require too many resources or make sure that you right size your resources so uh, that is installation and configuration of the pod service